Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. My name is Tilly and I am a strength and conditioning coach. If you're new here, I just wanna remind you to like and subscribe because it'll mean you get to stay up to date with some really cool sports science discussions and you'll definitely hear all about the research behind each topic. I wanted to make this video today because every couple of years we get the new iteration of the low carb diet. Previously, it was the keto diet or the paleolithic diet. More recently, I've been seeing people like Liver King telling his millions of followers that an all meat diet is the way to go for health, longevity, and performance. And quite frankly, this is just such f***ing balls. As my profession is strength and conditioning, today we are gonna be talking about how it is physically impossible for you to do high intensity exercise and perform well on a low carb diet. If you disagree, you can either click away or you can keep watching and see if some of the research will change your mind. First, let's talk about what a carb is and how much of it we need to eat. Carbohydrates are found in so many different food sources. Think fruits, vegetables, grains, and their related products like breads, pastas, everything really. Although. Obviously, some food sources have higher content of carbohydrate than others. Carbohydrates are our brain and our spinal cords favorite food to eat, favorite form of energy. And because of this, the acceptable macronutrient distribution range for carbohydrates is between 45 and 60%. This means of all of our total calories, carbohydrates should make up between 45 and 60%. That's the majority of our food. It's quite a lot, really. And that's because it actually takes about 125 to 150 grams of carbs every day just to keep your brain and your spinal cord or your central nervous system running smoothly. Low carb diets cannot make up this amount and that's why people often report brain fog or symptoms like that when they're on low carb diets. Just based off that little bit so far, does it seem like the right thing to do to cut out an entire macronutrient that should be making up the majority of our diet? Let's look further. In our body, carbohydrates are stored as glycogen. In our muscles, we can store about 300 to 400 grams of glycogen. But in our liver, we store about 70 to 100 grams. Because of this, it's really important that we consume enough carbs so that we can maintain these quite limited stores. One of our incredibly important energy systems, the glycolytic system, utilizes carbohydrates in the form of glucose and glycogen to fuel high intensity exercise. Here's a little diagram to show when glycolysis provides energy for us or when our glycolytic system kicks in. You can see it kicks in after the first couple of seconds and then it slowly dwindles a little bit there. If we have low muscle glycogen, it severely, severely compromises the ability of the fast glycolytic system to provide energy for us. And that is energy that we need to perform. So take a guess at what sports rely heavily on the glycolytic system. Team sports or anything classified as high intensity. Have a look at this diagram that I popped up in another video. This talks about what energy systems are used and at what intensities of exercise they are used. Carbohydrates fuel the glycolytic system, which based on this little table, means that they fuel high intensity exercise. We need carbs. The rate at which glycogen depletes is directly related to the intensity of the exercise or the sport that we are engaging in. And glycogen is absolutely key for about moderate to high intensity exercise. In things like resistance training or repeated sprint training or team sports, our glycogen stores become significantly depleted. Glycogen can deplete as much as 20 to 50% after just a few sets and repetitions of of resistance training. Now, long duration aerobic exercise primarily relies on fat as a fuel source. However, performance in long duration aerobic exercise is also compromised by glycogen depletion. Glycogen usually becomes impaired or decreases around that 45 minute mark for endurance athletes. Switching sports again, here's a little diagram to show how glycogen is depleted in a soccer match. You can see it says after the game, 36% of muscle fibers were rated as almost complete completely empty and 11% of the muscle fibers were rated as completely empty. That is a massive decrease in glycogen. And I mean, we can see this in other sports as well with rugby league players losing approximately 40% of their glycogen after a competitive match. Now let me pose this question. If you were to start off the game with lower glycogen stores because you're on a low carb diet, how do you think you would perform? Contrary to popular belief, if you are eating a low carb diet, 
your glycogen stores still deplete. This is because our body doesn't just suddenly switch to using fat as a fuel, just because there's a lack of glucose or glycogen. And this is because fat is not a fuel in high intensity exercise. I'll show you more specifically how that glycogen depletion impacts our performance, but for now, I just wanted to show you how crazy it is, the amount that we actually lose after just one match. Knowing all of this and knowing how the energy systems work and knowing that we still lose glycogen, even on a low carb diet, it kind of makes you wonder how and why the low carb diet became all the rage. And there are some aspects of this propaganda in the research that could be quite convincing when taken at face value. Primarily what I'm talking about is the fact that low carbohydrate diets have the potential to alter our cell signaling pathways. They can promote adaptations related to endurance performance and low carb diets can block the pathways that are related to the ability to put on muscle. So within the endurance community, obviously we want to promote endurance adaptations. Adaptation. And therefore low carb diets have become quite popular in this space and it's kind of extended to other sports as well. Low carb diets are also really popular because like I said in the beginning, they're an elimination diet. So it's essentially just calorie restriction. And for many people, they might feel that this is something they want because unfortunately our society puts a stupidly high value on thinness. The elimination part of the diet as well might mean that lots of people are removing their food intolerances. So anecdotally, they might feel better. In my own personal view, cutting out an entire macronutrient is just not a good idea. It's not sustainable. And once more, I'm going to yell into the camera that it is biochemically impossible to support high intensity exercise without carbohydrates. I repeat this again because I've seen it popularized that when you cut out carbs, like I mentioned earlier, you immediately switch to using fat for fuel. And that could be good because we do have a lot of fat on our bodies. We have far more fat than we do glycogen, but our glycolytic energy system just does not use fat. It just doesn't. And I know in this part I'll have some people disagree, but endurance sports like marathons, triathlons, or long distance cycling, they are not high intensity activities. They primarily rely on fat oxidation for fuel. And they can use fat for fuel because it's a low intensity and there is oxygen present. We go back and look at the article that I previously showed you, where rugby league players experience a 40% decline in glycogen content post match. And now we're going to highlight it, it's whether or not they started with a high carb or a low carb diet. And by now you guys should know why, because this is how we support performance at high intensities. You with me? Now finally the part that you've probably been waiting for, let's talk about how carbohydrates impact our ability to perform. This study on well-trained cyclists showed that higher carbohydrate diets were associated with increased cycle performance and increased time to failure. This study on professional soccer players showed that those who consume a higher carbohydrate diet covered more distance in games at all speeds compared to the low carb team. And I mean, this just wasn't one player. 20 players on the high carb diet outperformed 20 others on the low carb diet. If you're wondering why soccer is considered high intensity, when they cover such great distances, it's because the actions are broken up. They're intermittent. You sprint for a couple of seconds and then you rest, or you sprint and then you kick and then you jog. It's broken up. The intensities change throughout the match and still primarily the overall intensity is quite high. This of course can change throughout the match and the main energy system working might shift depending on how long the athlete is playing for. Please also remember as I say this, our energy systems always work simultaneously. There's just one that takes the brunt of the work and then they kind of switch over, but our body never works in isolation. Bit of a tangent, sorry. Let's keep looking at how our performance is affected by carbohydrates. In elite race walkers, they found that when on a low carb diet, the exercise economy was impaired. And this just means that the athletes require more oxygen for every movement that they do. The same researchers also found that a keto diet lessens the training induced performance improvements. Now we train with the whole idea being that the training will help improve the performance. If it was concluded that a keto diet means that we can translate less of our training to performance, then that is a pretty good indicator that a low carb keto diet it is not an appropriate nutrition strategy. In resistance training, high carbohydrates can help to promote muscle protein synthesis. And this is because of that cell signaling stuff that I mentioned earlier. Glycogen can act as a regulator for the cell signaling processes that 
upregulate hypertrophy. So essentially what this means is more carbs equals bigger muscles. Low glycogen content, on the other hand, can inhibit the muscle building as it activates a separate cell signaling pathway. Nancy Clark from Team USA Taekwondo wrote a blog post citing lots of the researchers that I'm referencing here today. Her overall conclusion was that athletes with depleted muscle glycogen experience needless fatigue, sluggishness, poor workouts, and reduced athletic performance. Nancy also highlights CrossFit athletes who consumed less than 40% of their total calories from carbohydrates were outperformed by those who consumed a higher carbohydrate diet. I truly think that the bulk of the research sides with high carbohydrate diets being the best nutrition strategy for whatever sport you are in. And research that doesn't side with this is often anecdotal, or it fails to account for practices that happen during the actual competitive event. So what I mean by that is that researchers might report that an athlete is on a low carb diet prior to the event, but then during the race or during the match, they consume a lot of those like simple sugar, the glucose packets that you use for energy to help them get through the match or help them get through the race. But those carbs count too, and they're often left out of the research method. One final thing that I wanted to mention in this video is that carbohydrates can help us from being overtrained. High carb diets have the ability to lower our ratings of perceived exertion, which means that we find workouts easier. They combat fatigue, they help us recover better, and they're therefore able to help us tolerate higher loads and train for longer. Those of us who are on lower carbohydrate diets may be more susceptible to slipping into that realm of overtraining. Of course, there are other factors that contribute to this as well. It's not just diet. So with all of this in mind, if watching your nutrition is something that you're into, I want you to make sure that you vary your carbohydrate intake throughout the training periods in the year. So if you're entering a competitive season where your training demands are really high and you're having to do competitions every week, then I want you to eat more carbohydrates to support this. If your training's taking a back seat for a little while, or you're in an off season, then slightly reducing your carbohydrate intake might be a good idea. As always, we do this because our body is amazing at adapting to stimuli that we expose it to. So we wanna make sure that eating carbohydrates at the times that we need it remains effective. And to do this, we need to have variation in our nutrition as well as our training. And whew, talked for a while there, but that is it for me today, guys. I hope you learned something. I highly recommend that you check out some of the research below if you're still a little bit mm, but carbs, carbs, carbs all the way, guys. <laughs> if you want me to make a video in the future talking about how much carbohydrate to eat or how to periodize it alongside your training plan, then please do let me know in the comment section below. Please remember to like and subscribe if you like this kind of content. I truly appreciate any and all support and it'll really help the channel to grow. If nothing else, that's it from me, guys. I hope you have an amazing week ahead and I hope you eat some friggin' carbs. <laughs> See ya, bye.